Well, tēnā koutou kato, ngā mihi nui ke koutou and hello. Uh, I would say good afternoon, because um, where I am in the world, it is the afternoon, uh, but I understand that many of you, of course, will be in various other parts of the world, so good night, good morning, um, hello, uh, wherever you are in the world. Uh, my name is James Shaw. Uh, I am the co-leader of the Green Party of Aotearoa New Zealand, uh, and I'm also our government's minister for climate change. Uh, and I'm an Associate Environment Minister with responsibility for our biodiversity regulations uh, and also uh, for our environmental reporting system. Um, we're going to be joined shortly by my colleague. She's just having some uh, technical issues, Marta Davidson, the co-leader of the Green Party. I'll introduce her uh, shortly. Um, but I'd like to introduce with you two of my colleagues from across the ditch, as we say, in Australia, um, which are Rebecca Vassarotti uh, and Shane Rattenbury, who are members of the Legislative Assembly for the uh, Australian Capital Territory. Australia, of course, is a federal uh, um, system, um, and the Australian Capital Territory is essentially the, the, the area that includes uh, the capital city of Canberra, um, where the Greens are in government, just as they are here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, so uh, what we thought that we would do uh, is take a few minutes, given the experience uh, of being in government or having one foot in government and one foot outside government in, in some situations, uh, and uh, for each of us to talk a little bit about that experience, what's the kind of key benefit that you get from being in government, also what's the key risk, just from, uh, from our perspectives. Um, once we uh, get through that kind of initial round of conversation, uh, we thought that we would just open it up to the floor uh, and take questions from our audience. Uh, and then we'll just kind of rotate through or whoever seems to be the most appropriate person uh, to answer each of uh, to answer each question uh, or, or, or respond to your comments uh, as you see fit. Now, my understanding is uh, that if you are an attendee uh, on the workshop today, um, that you can see the, the chat function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, and what we would like to do uh, is to have you put your uh, questions or your comments into that chat function. Uh, and then I will um, facilitate the session and I'll just sort of pick up uh, some of the key uh, questions that seem to be emerging uh, from there. So uh, there's some guidelines that are in the chat there already uh, from um, the hosts uh, and um, you know, as we get to it at any point, just please feel free to uh, to type your answers, uh, sorry, type your questions rather uh, into that. Um, okay, so um, just whilst we're uh, waiting for Manama, uh, Rebecca, I understand that you are a, uh, a member of the Legislative Assembly and you don't hold at the moment portfolio responsibilities, is that correct? No, that's not correct, actually. I am okay, I have that wrong. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm actually uh, one of the three Greens ministers um, that we now have um, in a nine-member a nine cabinet. Um, so we sort of have a third of, a third of government, um, and that came about due to the fact that we um, were very, we were quite successful in our last election in 2020, where we won six of the 25 seats in the assembly, which um, um, was an increase from two in the previous term. Well, that's stunning. So what, tell me, what are your um, portfolio responsibilities and what's the key uh, benefit of being in government and what are the key risks uh, of being in government in your view? and the, and yes. the experience that you've had. Yeah, so look, um, thank you very much. And it's great to um, speak to everyone, Yuma, in the, the language of the Ngunnawal people that are the traditional owners of the beautiful land that I get to call home. Um, and so um, I am very lucky to have a number of portfolios. Some of them actually um, might be of interest to you, James, um, that in that I am the Minister for the Environment, the Minister for Heritage, the Minister for Sustainable Building and Construction and the Minister for Homelessness and Housing Services. So one of the wonderful opportunities that I have is that I get to look at environment, built environment and people. And so um, that's, a really, that's a really exciting thing. So I'm a relatively new um, member. I, I came straight um, into parliament and into a ministry. Um, so that was an incredible, um, incredible leap. 
and um, you know we, we might at some point just get into some of the you know the the, the ways that that was possible and you know, and um, and that was absolutely because of some of the incredible work that Shane and um, colleagues before before me had done. But look, in terms of the um, the great opportunities, it really is to be absolutely central to the decision making um, the decision making process. We are really lucky here in the ACT that we have shared government and been in a balance of power arrangement for 10 years. So we have a really strong foundation to work with our governing partner and really shape the strategic direct um, strategic agenda and have a real opportunity to directly um, implement change. Government gives us resources through our departments and our directorates. It also gives us the resources of government. Um, but, you know, particularly as a junior partner of government, um, there are some significant risks. And I, I know that Shane has a lot to say around both the benefits and the, um, and the risks. So I don't want to steal his thunder too much. But certainly in terms of this real challenge of, and, and, and this is a challenge that we have really had to um, face this term, the idea of having one foot in government and one foot outside of government, when you have a third of cabinet, you can't pretend that you're not in government, and we really have to, yeah, um, you know, be very, um, be very clear that we are one of the parties of government. But you know, it's a it's a shared arrangement. Compromise is really important, um, and um, we really always need to balance what compromise is not selling out values and, and getting us on the on the journey. So that's absolutely the key thing. And bringing our, our, our membership and our community with us in terms of, I'm sure it's similar for you, James, um, people have very high expectations of the Greens as a political party, as they should, um, but the um, expectations are sometimes really hard to meet when you don't have all the levers. So I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. And I think, uh, Rebecca, probably um, there are going to be variations on those themes uh, from all of us and from a number of the people who are attendees on this. I just want to welcome Marama Davidson, my co-leader of the Green Party of Aotearoa uh, New Zealand. Um, Marama, we'll just give you a minute to settle in um, and um, we'll ask Shane to uh, pick up. Now, Shane, um, you've been in the uh, Legislative Assembly uh, for a few terms now. Mm -hmm. um, and you're the leader of the Green Party in the uh, Australian Capital Territory, as well as being a, a government minister. Yeah, thanks, James. Look, I first got elected in 2008, so I'm starting to become one of the old hands. But uh, yeah, it's it's been great to have this term a new team arrive as well. Uh, we were we've we've sort of had this roller coaster since 2008. We've had, held the balance of power since then, so across four terms. So we've now had four power sharing agreements with the Labor Party here in the ACT, but each one's been quite different. In the first term, we were all brand new members of parliament. None of us had been there before, so we didn't go into the, into the ministry. The next election, we lost a lot of our seats. I was the only one left and I became a minister. Uh, and we've held ministries since then. And this term has been a very different experience having several cabinet ministers for the Greens. I think as Rebecca touched on the sort of the most valuable part of being in government is that ability to set the agenda. We have been able to deliver policies that we took to the election that our members voted for that are now part of the way the ACT is. We are commonly described as the most progressive jurisdiction in Australia. Uh, we've got policies in place, for example, to we have legislated greenhouse gas targets. The first one was in 2020. It was to cut our emissions by 40%. We actually met it and exceeded it. So our emissions are now 45% below 1990 levels. As part of getting there, we have 100% renewable electricity. Uh, we finally started building a light rail system here in the ACT, as, which was committed to in one of our agreements. It's been talked about for the better part of 100 years, and it wasn't until the Greens won the balance of power that we got it. You know, so I think for our members, there's a real reward in us being in government and pushing our own agenda, but then also as other issues come forward, being able to make sure there's a green tinge put on that decision making. Uh, it, there is also that incredible, and you guys will have experienced this, that incredible strength that comes from being in government, having access to this enormous amount of information in a way that you don't necessarily have if you're not in government. And uh, even having our ability to get our departments to do something. Rebecca and I 
crossover portfolio. So I'm the Attorney General. I'm the Minister for uh, Climate um, Emissions Reduction, Energy and Water. I'm the Minister for Gaming and I'm also the Minister for Consumer Affairs. So I've got a few portfolios. But Rebecca is currently working on an agriculture policy uh, for our jurisdiction. We had a catch up this week and she's like, oh, I need to find out about water. And so I said, well, I'll get my directorate to go, my department to go and prepare a brief on what water's available for urban farming in the ACT. And so just being able to do those sort of things is so, gives us so much more strength than when you're just Greens sitting as a few members of Parliament that you don't have that access to information. So I'll stop there. There are a few highlights, I think, in some of the context of where we sit. That's great. Thanks very much, Shane. Um, now um, I'd like to introduce uh, my uh, co-leader of uh, Green Party of Aotearoa New Zealand, Marama Davidson. Um, Marama uh, is our min government's minister for the prevention of family violence and sexual violence, uh, and is also an associate housing minister with specific responsibility for the homelessness program. Um, so uh, Marama also uh, is uh, one of um, the country's Indigenous members of Parliament uh, and a leader uh, in uh, that community. Um, and um, so in terms of us having co-leaders, uh, I'm not. Um, uh, so um, there, that brings a, a particular dimension to her leadership uh, as well. Uh, Marama. Kia ora, James. Thank you. Uh, tēnā koutou katoa, he mihinui kia koutou. Tēnei he uri o ngā iwi o te tai tōkirau me te tai rāwhiti nō ngā puhi te rarawa me ngā te parau. Kia ora tātou katoa. Uh, thank you, James. I've just um, introduced myself in our Indigenous language, te reo Māori, um, and particularly my connection to my peoples um, of the ngā puhi te rarawa and ngā te parau um, iwi um, peoples. So, it's pretty awesome to be able to have this really vital conversation in terms of Global Greens movements and how we work out the levers of power and how we work out how to be in power with access to some levels of power while also maintaining our grassroots connections and continuing to inspire, most importantly, of course, all of our own members and networks and supporters. Um, so thank you very much um, for this opportunity for a, a really crucially timely discussion. Um, and I think that's probably my starting point is and the whole and the whole reason why I as an indigenous woman, um, Tangata Whenua of Aotearoa New Zealand is with the Green Party is because of that holistic um, all seeing, all connectedness perspective and lens that we bring to all of the issues, which absolutely, absolutely aligns with an Indigenous way of thinking where we have never um, lived, where things are in silos and are in isolation of each other, where we've always needed to understand how all issues, all challenges are absolutely interconnected, interrelated and interdependent. And so what does that mean then for me as a as a Crown, as a government minister in Parliament? What does that mean for us as Greens in at a turning point, at a political turning point, where we've got some major, major global issues, um, where they impact hugely on us at a at an Aotearoa and, and domestic level, where they impact on us on us hugely in our everyday level. And I have been an MP, I've been a politician for goodness, coming up to six and a half years. I've been co-leader since 2018 and I've been a minister for the past year. And those roles are different actually, um, and quite different. And becoming a minister has been a real massive learning curve in terms of how to get things done what are the relationships? And, and I'm very, very sorry I've missed both Rebecca and James's discussion because I'm I know it would have fed into mine as well. Um, how do we get things done? Not just as Crown Ministers, but as Green Ministers. There is no point in having James and I as ministers if we are not going to come at that from a perspective of being green ministers. Um, 
how do we get stuff done how do we ensure because i i reckon james if you haven't already something that james and i are both really clear on is um, the work we do is relational not transactional so what are those relationships that we depend on to get stuff done in the game of politics and the game of government and then how do we ensure that our presence and our ability to be independent voices with specific green kopapa, specific green agenda, how do we maintain that strength and presence in our grassroots communities and movements so that they can continue to feel the faith that we can absolutely get good green change and make things happen while also being really, really clear of the far bigger, much more transformational change and the system change that is required. And we all know that governments around the world have never been good at system change. And in fact, as a rule, have sought to protect the status quo of a system that is oppressive to both planet and people. So balancing all of those things is, is what we go to bed with and wake up with every single day and the challenges and the negotiations and and making sure that we and it's a hard job and we don't always do it well that we are connected consistently to our membership the very very people around our grassroots communities who are where the power and the mandate needs to come from so that's probably enough from me for now um, and I'm sure there's lots more incredible discussion to have. Thanks, James. Kia ora, Marama. Um, so from my own perspective, I, I mean, I, I'd be repeating a lot of what uh, the three of uh, you have already said, um, but uh, for a bit of context, this is our second term in government, um, but this is the first time that we've been in government, or these two terms that, that we are currently in government are the first time that we have been in government since uh, we were formed in 1990. So we've spent um, uh, 30 years in opposition, uh, 20 years of those were in parliament, but in opposition, uh, and then we got into government in 2017. Um, so we've actually got less experience uh, in terms of that time span um, than uh, the, uh, our, current, our, our friends in, in, the, in the Australian Capital Territory. Um, but Shane, one of the things that you said is that in your four terms in government, you've been through a number of different configurations. Uh, and uh, we are in a quite a different configuration now from the configuration that we had in our first term in government between 2017 and 2020. Um, because in that first term with uh, Jacinda Ardern, there was also a third political party who were um, economically uh, left, but um, kind of socially quite conservative. Uh, and whilst there were areas that we agreed on, there were also quite a lot of areas that we disagreed on. But the nature of the of the parliament were that you needed the agreement of all three parties to get anything done, um, because you couldn't you couldn't just do it on a majority of you know one of the three or two of the three. You actually needed the consensus across uh, all three. Um, and what that meant was that although we technically we weren't sitting in cabinet, we were kind of consulted on every single cabinet decision. Um, and that had its ups because it meant that we could participate in every decision of government. Um, it had its downside. It meant that we had to <laughs> uh, go to the, you know, like it's quite difficult when you're a small party to kind of match the scale of the rest of the government and, and to be able to handle the volume uh, of material that was going through. But we were kind of more in the middle of things. Uh, with that. Um, the last election in 2020 um, produced a very odd result for a proportional representation parliament like ours, which is that Labour actually uh, won 50% of the vote um, and were able to form a government by themselves. So they didn't actually need us to be able to form a, a government, but nevertheless, um, they did invite uh, the Greens into a conversation to, to come into a cooperation agreement with them. And that's why Marama and I are, are ministers in this government as well. But um, they also, because they don't need us, we're much more kind of uh, on, on the kind of side when it comes to um, areas of government that are outside of our cooperation agreement. So we have, a, a, you know, an agreement with some quite defined areas 
which really cover our ministerial portfolios, climate change, biodiversity and the protection of nature, family violence and sexual violence, housing, uh, and, and a few others. So those are kind of the, that's, that's the nature of it. And, and for me, it's been um, fascinating having been in both of those governments under those two configurations, because I think they've had different opportunities and different risks uh, in each ones. There's some that's commonality, but I think the nature of the, of the configuration is actually really important for um, you know, people who are attendees on this uh, seminar. If you're, if you're kind of facing the likelihood that you may be able to form a government in the near term, um, some of the things that uh, you need to consider are things like um, you know, how many of you are there versus how many of them are there. Um, uh, how much access will you have to information about parts of government that uh, you don't have direct responsibility for because of the portfolio overlaps between what it is that you, you're going to be asked to do and, and what it is that, that they are um, asked to do. Um, and for us, you know, as Marama said, um, because we don't have uh, that leverage of them needing our votes, um, it relies heavily on the quality of our relationship with our um, counterparts. Uh, in the Labour Party and, and our ministers. And we get on pretty well with the vast majority of them. Um, and I think in our experience, the ones where we don't get along, it's not necessarily partisan. Um, that's a, just often a personality thing. Uh, who ends up in government um, rather than which you know, political party they belong to. Um, but that can make things go faster or it can make things uh, very difficult and challenging indeed. Um, and Rebecca, the thing, the point that you made that that I, I particularly resonated with was, um, and Marama, you know, talked about this as well, is the expectations of our members, um, uh, you know, eye-wateringly high, and they've been waiting a very long time uh, for the opportunity to exercise some political power in this sense, and also they're very conscious that we have a very limited window of opportunity uh, to, you know, prevent catastrophic climate change. Um, and so they want to see a lot of action in a very, very short period of time. Um, and uh, that's entirely reasonable, um, but also the nature of government uh, and of our coalition uh, partners isn't always, doesn't always have the same sense of urgency and priority that we might attach to, to some of those things. So that, that kind of conundrum, uh, I think, is, is, is probably going to come up a lot uh, during the course of, uh, of this conversation. And I see some of the questions in the chat kind of reflect uh, people's concerns about that. Um, I'll, I'll just, I'll wrap um, uh, my segment and then we'll, we'll go over to some of the questions. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to say is that there, there isn't just, in my view, there isn't just in government or in opposition, right? There's a spectrum um, in which you're really, really out. And then there's, you know, at one end and then you're really, really in uh, at the other. Um, and Rebecca, you know, you talked about this, when you occupy a third of the government, you can't easily disown the decisions of the rest of the government, even if you don't wholly like them. For Marta and I, it's a little bit easier because the nature of our relationship is such that um, there's no expectation that we need to support the rest of the decisions. Uh, and quite a lot of the time we don't. Um, the thing that we have to manage is the extent to which we come out strongly against government decisions. Will that damage the relationships that we have that we then rely on to do the things that we do want to do. And of course, you know, at the other end of the spectrum, you can be as vocal as you want um, and as critical as you want. But the downside, of course, is that you don't get to uh, influence things terribly much. You might get little wins here and there, um, but it's nothing on the scale of uh, what you can do when you're in government. So it's a rich and uh, and varied minefield uh, of um, of choices that we uh, that we make. Um, so uh, what I've I've got a, a few questions here, um, and actually maybe um, we'll start this one. I'll come back to you, perhaps Rebecca, on this one uh, because you raised it yourself, um, and I'm not sure where everyone is from uh, who's asking this, but Mike Feinstein. Um, has asked, uh, since there's so much compromise involved in being a junior partner, and since a lot of that happens in discussions within the government, how have you handled explaining compromise decisions to your party's grassroots membership? And then, um, Manu, I might flip to you on this one as well, because we've got lots of experience on that one. 
Yeah, look, it's a really great question. And I think one of the things that we have learned through, you know, working through a couple of terms is it's actually um, doing a whole lot of work up front, particularly around the, the agenda. And I and I, I understand that the um, New Zealand Greens use a similar um, system in terms of a, we, um, we have a, a very important document that we negotiate as our very first um, step as, as, as part of the negotiation and that is the parliamentary and governing agreement. Interestingly, it used to be called the parliamentary agreement, but it was um, with our governing partner wanted to change it to this term um, to, talk, to call it the, governing, the um, parliamentary and governing agreement to emphasise that we were actually part of government, which is a very interesting thing that they wanted to emphasise the fact that the Greens were here. Um, and so um, that, that, that was sort of an interesting, uh, interesting little take for us. And so one of the things um, that we are able to do through that um, parliamentary and governing agreement is that we, we actually work through some of the areas of policy that we knew were going to be contentious, that through our election platforms, we knew that there was quite significant difference between the Labor Party and the Greens Party. And so we actually did a whole lot of quite hard negotiation at the very front of our term. The, the, the few, first few days of government is probably our biggest opportunity to influence the agenda. And that has really, you know, has really set the terms for our strategic agenda. So that is explicit. That is trans. That is transparent, and that and the community, can, you know, is able to judge how we are going in terms of working through our shared our shared agenda. So, you know, the way that this this agreement is structured is really interesting. That the 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 top part of the agreement, which is sort of our shared shared um, shared terms, are kind of the contention things. They're not all of the things we wouldn't put some of these things as a priority, a priority document. And then we've got other appendixes that talk about election priorities that both of us will progress. And so environment is not up in the top. Climate change is, but environment is it. It's in our appendix. And so, you know, that's not actually something we we would have structured it that way. And you know, we're reflecting on that as well. So I think part of it is about being really clear about our agenda and what this strategic agenda is about. Um, and I think for me, just in terms of working through all of these issues, it was one of the learnings that I was going to talk about. I think in terms of being really clear what our end game is. And so what, what we are trying to achieve, and you know, we, we, I, think, I think we've been quite good um, in our jurisdiction to have a bit of a, an eye to the long game, that we may not get everything that we want right now, but if we can demonstrate to the community and particularly our members that we are working through the journey, um, we feel like, that is a very transparent way of, of, of working through why we've compromised and where, where we are on, on the journey. So I don't know if Shane, had, Shane might have something to add on that. Oh, no, let's go to Mar Marama, how are you? Yeah, look, I, this, is, um, this is something, great question. And, I, and I'll just quickly take the opportunity to acknowledge we got a, we got a uh, follow-up note from Mike to say that they are a former Green Mayor from Santa Monica, California. So fabulous question. Um, one of the things that popped into my mind is, as Rebecca was talking, absolutely agree. That upfront work in my mind is also the open communication and relationship work for me. It's, it's, it's not simply, for us, it's not simply just about um, formal agreements the upfront work is also about having the ongoing ongoing discussions and open communications and and on particular examples and James you'll have the better examples in your head but we also it's also follow-up work um, so actually the pandemic has actually ended up opening up opportunities whereby we could hold uh, nationwide zoom discussions with our members from across the country say following various announcements or decisions as ministers that might be controversial on some nature and particularly in our in our climate um, portfolio challenges where we will make sure that we are available to talk through that with our members supporters our networks and that has been crucial that is going to continue to play a massive role in terms of explaining that compromise as was in your question um, and decisions and walking our 
grassroots members through how things have happened, what's at stake. I think we'll all understand um, we'll all understand that what ends up getting out there in in the isthmus in the in the atmosphere, what's online, the information as we all know, isn't always fulsome, isn't always isn't sometimes even accurate. So really being able to have those conversations and be held to account actually um, is putting ourselves in front and with our members to be absolutely held to account and walking that through. Um, often the information that is that available and that gets a, that gets highlighted and the sensational clickbait stuff is without a lot of the context um, and is without a lot of the understanding that goes into any day-to-day -day decisions. So, that has been crucial. That open communication is, is probably my main point. Um, I want to. All, I also just wanted to finish on the collective nature of our work, especially with our with you know, and, and here in Aotearoa at least, um, and I'm sure around the world for Global Greens. But people do look at us a bit funny with the way our caucus is structured, who our who we include in our caucus meetings and our decision making, for example, pulling our network party leaders into though into that level of decision making and discussion at our caucus meetings for example that's unique to us so being able to make collective decisions and coming to those decisions collectively is also another i guess stronghold in being able to have those decisions come to that consensus and then be able to stand by them is another part so you know it's that um open communication lines and that collective decision making. Thanks, James. Thanks, Marama. Um, I, I've got a, I do have a question for Shane, um, because you uh, were sort of talking about this in terms of in your op opening uh, re um, questions, your, your opening remarks. Sorry, I'm just trying to keep track of the um, chat here because we've got lots of interested people. <laughs> Um, so there was a question from Stephen Young, um, which is, does cabinet solidarity uh, require you to publicly support decisions that you Greens don't agree with? Uh, and if it does, how do you manage the optics of that? Yeah, it's a really good question, James, because, you know, in the Westminster tradition, cabinet solidarity is, of course, just a core thing. But what we've done, firstly, in our agreements, we set out the rules about how these decisions get made. So again, right at the front of the term, there's a really clear understanding of both how these things will be made and if there's disagreement, how we'll resolve it. But one of the things we have pulled apart is the notion of cabinet confidentiality and cabinet solidarity. And so we're very clear, we have strict commitment to cabinet confidentiality so that we can have all the conversations in the cabinet room People can say exactly what they want to say. We don't come out and sort of snipe at each other about, oh, you said this in cabinet and blah, blah, blah. But if after that cabinet discussion, we still don't have agreement, then we don't have to have cabinet solidarity. We have a clear understanding that we can agree to disagree in the cabinet room and we Greens will walk out and take our own position in the parliament. It doesn't happen often. It's very interesting that our governing partner really tries to minimise the amount of occasions on which they see that split because then for them, a splitting government is, is, you know, it's almost death. It's the worst thing that can happen. Uh, so they work very hard, but we do have that freedom. And we've exercised it maybe half a dozen times over the last six or seven years where we've actually gone into the chamber and voted differently. And that's okay. We just agree on that, disagree on that issue, but continue to function as a government. So I think that split between cabinet confidentiality and cabinet solidarity is really important to understand. Just on that, are you, if you do, exercise your agree to disagree provision does that mean that you're then able because i uh, what, what does that do in terms of your parliamentary vote because I, I can see a world in where um you could come out of a cabinet decision and say well you know we fought our corner we lost we don't necessarily agree with it but you can still uphold like you can either vote you know for or abstain um but if your numbers were needed to pass something how do you how do you kind of handle that? No, look under this arrangement, we can simply vote against it in Parliament. Now, where it's happened, generally the Conservative Party has backed it, and so where Labor and the Conservative Party that's they still get it through 
uh, and we just end up voting against it. So it's a much bigger block and then just us by ourselves often. So that's how that's dealt with. You know, we've been very clear that having a disagreement on an issue is not, and we've trained the media to understand this, we've trained the parliament to understand it, it doesn't mean the end of the government. It means we disagree on this issue, but we are still a government and we still keep working together. We, we have a, a similar experience, and actually it was our first term in government that really, I think, um, kind of got us through that because you had three political parties who were quite different um, and had clear disagreements about, you know, some reasonably significant um, areas, um, some of whom were more disciplined about how they managed that than others. Um, and uh, we, of course, were absolute saints uh, in terms of how we managed it. Um, but... I, I remember thinking after, the, I, think, I think in the, sort of the first six months of that government's life, the media assumed that we were going to collapse kind of every five minutes because, you know, we had these kind of obvious uh, disagreements. But actually airing them in public kind of made it normal for people, you know, and, and there was this kind of sense of, well, of course, they're not going to agree on everything. That's why they're different political parties. If they agreed on everything, they'd just be one political party. So I think that kind of normalized it, actually. Um, and now it, it, it sort of, I, I don't think there's any expectation that the government will co collapse just because they happen to disagree even quite strongly about one particular um, one, one particular issue. Um, for, for us in this term, it's a little bit different because uh, we, we're actually only required to exercise cabinet collective responsibility in our portfolio areas. So obviously I have to uphold cabinet collective responsibility for climate change because I am the minister for climate change. So I am the government spokesperson. So I can't kind of, you know, say, and I mean, I don't always agree with the decisions that we collectively get to, right? But that's fine. But there, then there will be other areas um, where we take, you know, quite a different view and, and there's no expectation there, but also our votes aren't required for those things. Um, I want to turn, I've got a question um, from Dr. Frank Habeneza, who uh, will be familiar to many of the people uh, on uh, this panel and, and who are attending. Um, Frank is a Green Party MP in Rwanda um, and uh, has, has been now for, for some time. So he's got a few questions. Uh, he says, the first question is, how do you get the Greens to manage their agenda and key priorities and not get swallowed up by the majority party? Which I think sort of relates to the, you know, Rebecca, that um, point that you raised in your opening comment about you know, when you're a third of the government, you can't pretend that you're not the government. On the other hand, when you're smaller, you, you, you know, you can be clearer about that. But on the other hand, you're more likely not to get your way more of the time. So how, how have you handled that? It's a really, it's a really good question. And um, it was, it was really interesting. Like it was, particularly when you get um, some of the ministerial, you know, the ministerial posts, which is, you know, in our, in our system, it is the, um, prerogative of the chief minister and and um, you know he was I, I feel like he was he was good to us in terms of the portfolios but you know like particularly with Shane taking on an attorney general's portfolio it's a big busy um, portfolio so you know that was that was something that I certainly talked about oh is this going to be too much are we just going to get swallowed up by busy work um, and I think that that you know one of the challenges is just when you are you know when you do have ministerial portfolios there's just a whole lot of business as usual work that needs to happen and and certainly the way that um, that I've tried to manage it and and we're working with our directorate is really looking at well what are the what are the strategic policy areas that we're trying to really push for and really push the agenda and what's the business as usual work that we really expect people to get on and on with and with that business of usual work absolutely going back to some of the comments that were made before by marina around you know how do we make that a green you know what's the green tinge to that what is the way that we can um, really respond to that and i think you know one of the things that you know, you know i've really learned particularly from um, the, the work that shane has done is in some really interesting portfolios like the consumer affairs portfolio is What's the niche, you know, like what is the really special thing that we can bring to portfolios that is a little bit different and that we can put a really green perspective on it. Um, but again, I think it does go to that, 
you know, what is our what is our key agenda? You know, like one of the great things that we have had is that I think you can really tell, even with our cabinet colleagues, they are now anticipating the kinds of questions that we'll ask, the kind of approach that we will have. And so we really are seeing even, you know, across government, you know, we I, I don't think we we have we, we need to have the fights that probably you know many other in many other um, governing um, arrangements have because we have been really clear about what we're we're trying to achieve. But uh, you know, Frank, I, it's for me it's an everyday challenge that we don't get caught up in just the busy work of ministries um, that we do you know like really um, focus on you know connecting to our membership. Um, being really available to our to our local community and really demonstrating a different way of doing doing governments. But you know, I think we're 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 in a really fortunate jurisdiction in that people kind of understand it, and and frankly, our our um, public servants are pretty excited about it. Often, there's a real energy in terms of, well, you know, what's a different way to do this, which is you know really lovely. Yeah, I think it'd be fair to say that some of our public servants were excited and some of them weren't uh, in terms of <laughs> our portfolios. But Shane, uh, you mentioned before that in a previous term, there was only one um, parliamentarian and that was you and you were also a minister. So you were clearly massively outnumbered as opposed to you know your current set of circumstances. How did you manage being the only Green MP and the only Green Minister uh, through, I mean, you, you clearly succeeded because you've got lots of friends now, but but how, how'd you pull that off? Yeah, look, it was a daunting term, James. We ended up, at that time, we had 17 members in our parliament. There was eight Labour Party members, eight Conservatives, and just me in the middle. Um, and we'd sort of, prior to that election, been planning that we might go into the ministry if we were successful, but then all my colleagues lost their seats. And after the election, we went, well, is that still the right plan? But we decided we would, partly because we were ready, we wanted to have a crack at it, but also it actually put us at the front of the decision-making. If I just sat in the parliament having to have the casting votes on every piece of legislation, it would have been incredibly hard. Because I think what you learn also is that it's much easier to change things when they've been designed than when you get to the final piece of legislation in parliament, it's much harder to negotiate. So being at the front of the decision-making probably actually helped us a lot in that term where we had such small numbers when the reality was that there were heaps of things we didn't get to work on and a lot of community events we didn't get to go to and that's the great beauty of having five colleagues now is that we are able to cover a lot more community issues in depth but um, you know one of the other things I was going to observe in, in response to some of Frank's questions was that one of the challenges of being in this position and holding the balance of power and how we meet members' expectations is being really clear about what our options are. Because really we don't, the leverage is interesting. We basically have two ends. There's, and I've been interested in your take on this, but there's kind of persuasion, i.e. you negotiate, you find a way through, you come to some common agreement. Or there's what we refer to as the nuclear option, which is bringing the government down. You know, and that's kind of the other extreme. And you can only bring the government down once a term. And the reality is if you bring the government down, the other side is the conservative side of politics, at least for us, which is possibly worse. And so there's some really interesting dynamics there around how do you, if a decision's coming through that you don't like, what options do you take? Because compromise and finding a way through that's mostly acceptable, it's either that or you literally pull out of the government. And so they're sort of, I think people don't appreciate the limited set of op options that are there for you in, in these circumstances. Mm. Yeah, I, I'm, I have to say I'm fascinated by uh, your response because one of the, uh, uh, I guess, pieces of conventional wisdom inside the Green Party of Aotearoa New Zealand is that you should really only go into government when you've got some decent numbers, right? Because otherwise you will, you will get swamped. So it's interesting to me that you, um, you actually said that during a period when there was only one of you, you know, that you had the minimum possible number uh, there, uh, north of zero, um, that actually going into government helped 
you know, because of, because of that kind of leverage and and that and that profile um, that it, that it brings with you. And I might come to Martima on this because there is a live discussion here, and I know that the Scottish Greens went through exactly the same conversation when they went into their recent um, cooperation agreement uh, in Scotland, um, which is is it better to? I think there's two parts. To, two parts to it. And, and a lot of it does come down to that agree to disagree function that you talked about before, the ability to say, well, look, you know, um, the government has decided to do the following. We weren't completely on board with that. We're obviously not going to bring the government down over it because as you say, the alternative would be worse. Um, but, you know, just to register the fact that, that we took a different view and that that was a sort of important condition to ensure that we didn't get swamped and you know blamed for everything that the Labour Party did that our people didn't like, but also um, uh, this kind of question about how much are you able to uh, kind of adopt a sort of an oppositional you know a high profile media position uh, when you're when you're in government. So, Madam, what are you, what are your thoughts on that? Now, I I just I wonder if you can tie in a response to Frank's second question, which was around. The ability to claim credit uh, when the majority party either wants to or people assume that they were the ones driving it which um, is a familiar feeling <laughs> yeah well such such relevant questions all of them both of those so perhaps um for, for all of this there's a whole entire communication strategy that runs through all of this and and how much extra we have to work to both keep ourselves distant from the, the terrible stuff that we do not want to be associated with, the bad decisions for planet and people, as well as be really, really strong in claiming either our influence or our leadership or our participation in really good green agenda and green decisions and policy changes. Um, and through all of that, is, is obviously a political strategy, but a, a massive communication strategy that runs alongside. And I and I want to and I want to add, it's a it's a massive communication strategy, in the context of the difficulty of not being the biggest main party Labour or the biggest opposition party National, and how much harder it means we have a responsibility to work up a good comm strategy. Now, I was just going to highlight an example. I, I had a look online to see if I could find it from a limb. Um, people might be able to find it uh, on the title from 22nd of November, big title in one of our major political newsroom platforms, um, uh, political platforms of newsroom. The title is called um, The Minister Happy to Call Out the PM on COVID. Greens co-leader Marama Davison says Labour ministers are making COVID decisions based on politics, not health advice. And I know we've had some questions specifically around COVID in this thread as well. And that's an example. And that particular announcement that we made, it, um, it got particular attention because people, the political commentary felt that we were being quite blunt in our critique and in our criticism. And so, you know, there was a little bit of, whoa, whoa. <laughs> look, what, look what the co-leader of the Greens has just said. There was a bit of that. And that's not the first time that we've done that through this agreement and through this arrangement. And actually that's important for us to be able to both and maintain a relationship um, and get things done with them and literally sit in a room and meet and work out how to work together as well as critique them publicly and directly. I wanted to say a while back in the discussion that um, the style of the Green Party is on a whole, uh, we have a particular way of criticizing as well. And it may not, you know, and that's just Green Party, Kopapa, that's just Green Party style of we really wanting to stick to the issue of not falling into political personal criticism our people don't like it and when is when it has looked like we have gone into there we've we've copped it big time we've copped it big time um so uh sort of but not being swallowed by 
majority parties, um, is all about making sure our presence and our independent political thinking and uh, advocacy and agenda is clear. For, similar to what you were saying, Rebecca, about when people know what to expect from you, forever the Greens have been really clear, and we use different terms from time to time, but climate, protecting nature, inequality, forever. You know, people know that about us, and it helps to make our uh, not being swallowed up for people understanding what we're about, what we stand for. It helps in terms of the understanding that happens after decisions. Um, and with taking the credit, oh, look, absolutely. That, that has also been about inspiring our grassroots supporters to spread our word. Um, that's what a lot of that rests on, um, asking, because we can't do it by ourselves. So our relationships to networks and stakeholders um, and giving them what they need to spread our word in the communities and the neighborhoods is absolutely how we also have to be able to take credit as well. Um, so Frank's got another uh, uh, question as well. And actually we might bring Frank in in a few minutes. Um, I'll just... Uh, work through that. So Frank, uh, prepare yourself. We might promote you to panelists shortly. Um, uh, but Frank asks, how can the Greens and government avoid being blamed for government failure? Um, with the example of Sweden, when the Greens left the government and are being blamed for all the shortfalls of the Social Democrats. Shane, I might come back to you on that one, just because you're shaking your head mournfully. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was just pondering that one, James. Look, I think it comes down to, and I really like the point Marama made around how we do our politics. You know, I think we need to be confident to go out and articulate why we have a different view, but that be about the policy rather than it being about the attack on person, other people. And I think that's how I, you know, all through my time, well, tried to do my politics. I'm sure I haven't always got it right, but uh, I think that creates a sense of integrity around us as well and people appreciate that and I think that overcomes some of those shorter term difficult moments if people you know I've really been inspired by the way Bob Brown was perceived at the end of his term in parliament and it's always something I've tried to model myself on and for people who don't know Australian politics so well Bob was one of the was the first green into our federal parliament and a well-known environmental hero but by the end of his term across the country people would say I may not always agree with Bob Brown but I respect the way he goes about it and I reckon that's a really key thing that any Green MP should be that's the way we should be aspired we should aspire to be talked about. Great thank you um, look we've managed to bring uh, Frank in um, into the conversation welcome Frank it's lovely to see you again. Um, yeah thank you very much yeah. Yeah, and I wonder, you know, because obviously uh, we've been talking very much from our experience in Australia and New Zealand, which are two similar countries in a lot of ways, not without our differences, but, you know, gen generally quite quite similar, both in terms of culture and political systems and, you know, economies and location even. Uh, so tell us what it's like in Rwanda as a Green MP and what's your relationship with the government you know, in terms of the questions that you were asking. Uh, okay, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I would say that we are now uh, three years in parliament and uh, we're the main opposition party. Uh, so we're the only party that is actually not in government. The other parties are in government. Uh, it's been quite a big challenge <clears throat> because uh, um, we campaigned for president in 2017 and that was, uh, we have a manifesto, clear written one, and then uh, we're the only party that carrying the ruling party because uh, all others were the coalition. And uh, the, in our manifesto, most of the things you campaigned for, the government copied them, took them up, and uh, it started implementing them. And the government claims all the credit <laughs> for everything that we, uh, we have. We, we, everyone knows that we are the ones who, uh, for example, campaigned for the increasement of the teachers' salaries, uh, improvement in the health sector, we have the mutual insurance, or increasing of the size for the military and the policemen. So everyone knows, but the government just takes all the credit and they don't want to mention us. So this is like a challenge. Um, and sometimes when we, uh, we have a chance to be on the national television with uh, 
a government minister or a government uh, person, we do say it loudly. We said, no, we are the ones who did this. And sometimes they just keep quiet. They don't to confront on the national TV. Uh, so we've just been pushing our voice because we know this is our agenda. We have said it loudly. And um, sometimes they try to oppose us and we counter, uh, uh, attack them. We say, no, this is, this is was, uh, then actually we tell them that you are not doing it right. Uh, like we proposed uh, opening up of the health uh, posts uh, on the grassroots level to have uh, health uh, kind of centers. And they didn't have it, we had it on the uh, higher level. And they, uh, that was in our presidential manifesto. And uh, they adopted it to and started drawing the uh, health post at um, uh, the village level. But they're doing it so badly. And uh, so we, we, we tell them that, you know, this was not the original plan. We thought we could have done it differently. Yeah. So it's a challenge even in parliament. Uh, um, we, uh, but we do rely on the media and the people because we say things. Uh, recently, we had a big uh, issue on the land uh, um, taxation. Uh, people, there was a big outcry in the country. And um, uh, so we, I even made a, a private member's bill to parliament to uh, change the uh, taxation law on uh, we call it, uh, um, immovable assets. And of course, they, uh, they, they blocked my law, they did uh, my bill. They didn't want it to get into uh, parliament. Uh, they asked me to make another law that suggests when the government loses money, how will the government get that money? And I said, well, it's not my responsibility. That would be the responsibility of the Ministry of Finance. And, uh, but what I did, that's everything I did, even the private uh, member's bill, I made sure that the media was aware of it. I had a like, one hour talk on the Voice of America. We have a, a local version of Voice of America. So, and uh, the, even one main newspaper uh, published almost part, all of it. And um, so when they refused, finally, uh, the president, uh, one person asked him in a meeting and he said, okay, let's put a hold on that uh, taxation law. So all the credit moved away from me and went to the president. So everyone started thanking the president. Oh, thank you, Mr. President. You are the one who have done this for us. And, uh, and uh, you know, it was, looked so, because, so, so sad because we've been campaigning for this for the last three years and there's some success now. But we have, we cannot, uh, everyone is thanking the president that who has done that, who has saved them. Uh, and now the government has accepted to revise the law because they issued mine, but the Minister of Finance has taken it up to revise the law. So we are waiting for in the parliament. So I'm saying, well, if it comes, we'll try to see if we can put in our ideas. But at the end of the day, it will be them when we have been the ones uh, uh, campaigning for this year. Uh, so we have had some successes, but it's always difficult to uh, claim credit. Uh, but we try to push our voice loud, yeah, I could say that, yeah. Well, thank you, Frank. I, I mean, I, I have had this experience uh, a few times where, um, you know, you want the win, right? You want to get that policy over the line. You believe in it, you know, the evidence supports it. It's a good idea. Um, but ultimately it's gonna require a minister from another party or, you know, somebody to, to kind of execute on it for which obviously they are going to want to, um, to be able to claim credit for it. And, and there have been a few times where, you know, I think we've had to sort of face this choice of going, well, how, how loudly do we want to try and claim credit for it? Because that might actually put at risk uh, getting the thing done, you know, and, and actually if it's a choice between getting it done and getting the credit for getting it done, you know, we'd rather get it done, right? Because it'll benefit all these people or it'll benefit the environment in some way or, or something like that. But it does mean that you kind of, grinding your teeth in the background going god damn it we that was us we did that you know and and, and we've got cases of people who frankly their you know their political careers kind of ended badly uh whose kind of positions on things are now widely accepted um and are kind of being adopted so you kind of it, it raises the question of what does success look like uh i think sometimes yeah no, we have had that experience as well. There are some issues uh, which have been uh, very politically sensitive, which were raised in parliament, also in public. And at the end of the day, the government starts acting on that. And then we keep quiet. We do discuss, uh, actually my fellow other MP, Honorable uh, Jean Claude in his mind, is also uh, on, on this uh, uh, session. Uh, we decide at least not, not to mention anything because if we mention something, maybe the government will stop acting. If they start acting, and uh, if you start claiming the credit, maybe they'll stop and then the people will lose. So sometimes we keep quiet and until when everything's done, then we can mention something. Or we just keep quiet and then we wait for the people because people are not fools. They start thanking us and mentioning it in the media themselves or on the Twitter and so on. And then we have just, just kept quiet. 
Yeah, so uh, that one, that's another strategy we use because you know some things are sensitive and um, and sometimes of course the president is the head of state, you don't want to look like you're poking him in the eye all the time. So and, uh, and the fact that he respects our ideas, we say that's good enough. Uh, so sometimes we just keep quiet and wait for everything to be done and then, but we record it when we have like a party congress, we mention everything. Now there, we have the media, we mention everything that has been done. And then we have, the, of course, the, no one will uh, oppose what we are saying because we have it on record, especially that it's in the manifesto of the presidential elections and also the manifesto for the uh, parliamentary elections. So we say, this is what we campaigned for. This is what we have done. So then it also helps us as accountability because people will say, what have you done in parliament? So then that is also another way of being accountable to the people. And when it's time for next elections, then we have something to show. Yes, Great, thank you. Manu, I want to come back to you. Um, there's a question from Tim Hollow, um, where he says that he's taken by your point about how you seek to drive systems change while operating in government, which is all about maintaining the status quo. And I'd love you to expand on that a little. Are there ways, in your opinion, for MPs and ministers to work to effectively devolve and dissolve coercive power whilst, frankly, exercising such power? And are there specific things that you can focus on to do? How do you manage the fact that very often government action is by its very nature emphasizes and protects the status quo? And um, I just you know, answer it how you want, but I, I wonder if you wanna talk about how the family violence and sexual violence yeah. strategy came about, because to me, that's just one of the best Pleasant examples answer. that I've seen of the Greens doing it differently yeah. in the face of you know, business as usual. Yes, ab absolutely. Thank you. Um, I think it was Tim. Thank you. Um, uh, as the Minister of Prevention, Family Violence, Sexual Violence, at the end of last year, the very end, it, it took it took a lot of work, of course. But um, the, we announced we launched the first ever comprehensive nationwide strategy, uh, twenty five year strategy and action plans to eliminate family violence, sexual violence. Now I'm picking up on your really excellent points around devolving and dissolving. So one of the key things for me about the strategy is it came from the sector, from the people. And it the only way that we are going to achieve the visions and the aims of it is by devolving and dissolving the current power structure and getting both authority, power and resource out to communities to do that work, to lead that work and, but that's very different from um, government neglecting. It's very different from a neoliberal small government model. It's about authentic, enduring partnership of governments supporting communities to lead and design and create those solutions to prevent and eliminate violence in our homes and communities. Now, that was specifically a very green way of doing things and required incredible negotiation across ministers because the my portfolio requires a joined up approach of working across our health education um, social um, social service departments housing departments police departments um, children protection agencies it requires pulling together our accident our accident compensation um, departments pulling together all of those departments all of their ministers all of their ceos and getting on the same page and agreeing agreeing that we must we're working towards a model that devolves out resource and power because the solutions the enduring solutions lie at community fano and uh, neighborhood level so um, that is also, I will say, that in general, our government has been coming to terms with that thinking for a few, for a while, for a while now. We have got in train a, a sort of public service project, if you like, that is working out how do we commission work? How do we work better with the experts, the sectors, the community organizations who know what is needed and what to do and so there's been that work happening alongside um, this strategy 
absolutely helps to pull that into focus, to pull that approach and that direction into focus. And it absolutely required battling for it every meeting. I, I mean, actually, that's what ministers do every meeting, but battling for it at every meeting to make sure that we've got faith and we can do this. We can be really clear that we're wanting to put the resourcing, the authority, the power back out to communities and people. Um, now we've got the strategy. We have to uh, deliver it now. And that's kind of when, I mean, the, the saying, not a very green one, of where the rubber hits the road. Now is when we're going to have more of those battles. Getting the launch of the strategy was the first early, early beginning step. Actually getting the power and the resourcing out there now that's going to require ongoing commitment, ongoing commitment and negotiation um, to convincing all of our leadership that that is the right thing to do and here is how we're going to do it. So it's, it's, it's tough actually. And, and can I just be really honest and frank and it can end in many, in tears across many people after many meetings, in fact. Um, and it's a it's a real tough grind, and James knows James knows this well also in climate. Um, but it's worth doing. It's worth doing. Yeah, Rebecca, I wonder if I mean you you've got quite a swag of portfolios um, to look after, um, with quite varied responsibilities. What's what's your sense of how you know kind of redesigning government in terms of that? that power relationship and that kind of coercive relationship that the state has? Yeah, look, I think it's it's a great question as always, Tim, and I'd really, you know, like I, I would really reflect very sim similarly in terms of, you know, like what we're trying to do is actually build a partnership with government, or with, um, with community, that it really is around how we, put, how we bring community in and really, you know, in quite a honest and open way say we are we are actually going to give up power so you know so some of the work that I'm doing at the moment is with our specialist homelessness sector that we have we have made a commitment um a stated commitment around um, eliminating homelessness and we are really committed in terms of how we might do this and so what but we we will not be able to do this alone and we're certainly not going to be able to do it from within the the homelessness port portfolio on its own but in terms of the initial steps it is actually about starting a very deep and honest conversation with the sector and really you know making it all you know a really um considered commitment to a co-design a co-design process so working together in terms of looking at very openly honestly what is working and actually being real you know like actually going you, we're not going to have to you don't have to fight about the stuff that we know is working well you know we're not going to put you through you know the hunger games of a procurement process around the stuff that we will you know you've been doing this work for decades we know you do it well um so you know we don't even have to have that conversation we also know that you haven't been resourced appropriately to do it so you know what are what are the early steps that um we were able to bring to the table is uh significant increase in base funding for the first time in almost a decade and that's and at, you know with those two things sort of you know on the table we could then have you know we could really start to build the trust about this is a real conversation that we're having we are doing this in partnership this will mean there will be some changes we do need to look at you know areas where there are gaps but we are going to do this together and we're in it we're in it, we're in it for the long you know for the long haul, there will be really difficult conversations, but we just want, you know, like we want a level, a level playing field as much as it can be, because there are still, you know, there is still power relationships. And I think we need to sort of be honest about where the boundaries are, that, you know, unfortunately that there will always be boundaries and, you know, we are, you know, operating in a, you know, in a, in a, in a particular system and we, as Greens, you know, we have decided to take political power is important and it's an extra step to then to step into government as well. And so we have to own, own that at one level. But, 
you know, working out what are the impediments to even start the conversation is really important. And then how we can really continually demonstrate um, that we are doing things differently and it is a real deep and authentic partnership with community. But that's really difficult and we're going to make mistakes. I've got a yeah. Well, I've got a I've got a follow up question there because one of the things, I mean, in in our system, um, I, I'm quite fed up with that. What I call the endless loop of consultation. So we keep going out and asking people what they think that we should do, and we end up asking the same people the same questions and getting the same answers, and it's not the same as um, partnering. Um, and it tends not to lead to much action either because there's always another round of consultation. You never get to an actual decision. But what one of the, you know, the, to, to kind of partner in the way that you're describing and that Martin is describing, you know, it requires an, a reorientation of how public agencies do things. It requires handing over some resource, you know, in order so that you've got a partner who's capable of interacting with a machine like the government. And presumably that takes more than one term of government to organise. Um, and then, of course, there is the high probability that at some point we'll get chucked out and the other team will have a go. And they've got different views about the world um, and, and how government should go about it. So how, how do you kind of cater for, you know, um, needing to take the time to build the trust, build the relationships, develop the capacity both in government and in your partner organisations in the community, and in our case, particularly with our Indigenous communities and, and so on. How, how do you take the time to do that effectively, knowing that, you know, there's a reasonable chance that it could get unwound in the future? So how do you deal with long-term, um, you know, sustainability of, of that approach? It's, it's really difficult. Uh, you know, like we have, you know, like we are in a pretty interesting situation in our in our jurisdiction, in that there has been some form of the same government for um, twenty years. So, you know, like it is, it is actually something that is pretty um, unique, and probably even five years ago wouldn't have been um, been thought to be possible. Um, and but and, and certainly, you know, certainly as a first time parliamentarian, and like you know. Somewhat precarious, I would say as well. I don't know how long, <laughs> how long I'm going to be there. So you know, like I've certainly, you know, from a personal perspective, I've gone, okay, you know, we don't know how long this will end, so we've got to make this count. Um, and so I think again, it's about that, you know, authentic, honest, you know, conversa conversations around some of that. I think again, it goes back to the stuff that um, has been talked about before in terms of the importance of relationships. And they are, you know, like they are often built at an individual level. And I think we need to really, um, you know, really be honest about that. And again, I think that that's one of the things that we've really benefited from, from a party. And with the, you know, like with the leadership and the consistency of Shane's role, he's really set a tone and he's really set an environment where there is, there, there is actually a level of trust within the community. And I think that we, you know, collectively, with our previous experiences, we've been able to build on that. And so it is a really fine line about, you know, taking the time and also in a, you know, in a sector that's been under-resourced, you can't, you know, like having a conversation and saying we need to take time with co-design but recognising that you haven't been properly funded for decades, you know, that's really, you know, that's really difficult. So I think for me certainly it's been about going, well, what is the stuff that we can move on a bit quickly and what can we actually decouple in terms of the impediments or the things that need to be dealt with now while we invest in the, the, the deep long-term conversations? Um, and I think we've been able to do that relatively successful, but I think it's always at risk because of the, those very issues that it's very difficult to be thinking in long-term, you know, like, you know, we really want to bring a long-term agenda in terms of the ideas that the Greens bring to the table they're not ideas that get up in one term. You know, when we some of the, you know, when we started talking about emissions, um, emissions targets, um, we laughed at, you know, I, I think Shane himself was laughed out of the room. And now, you know, now the our governing partner likes to take credit for that issue. So we are very much with a long-term agenda. 
Um, but you know what what we can bake in in terms of the you know the milestones while we get there, I think is important. Yeah, great. Thank you for that. It's it's sort of one of my obsessions is recognizing that we've inherited a public service and a government that's been shaped over the course of the last three decades, you know, by you know a particular approach to government. Um, by governments both that were led by Labour and the National Party, which is our Conservative Party. Um, and yet, you know, I mean, I certainly feel it because in climate change, we're up against a deadline. You know, you have X remaining years to fix this problem. Uh, the kind of public sector reform is going to take about that long. And, you know, so if you focus on that, then you don't focus on climate change. So it's like, do you just work with what you've got and kind of do what you can? Or do you focus on kind of, you know, system reform or do you do a bit of both? Shane, I, I wonder if you could, you know, because you've had longer at this gig than any of the rest of us. Um, what, what's your reflection on, on that question? Perhaps picking up where you just left off, James, and one of the things about the public service is they're risk averse, you know, and they they often are just, particularly if they disagree with you, they, there is a mentality where they go, well, we'll just wait till this minister goes because ministers come and go, but the public service remains here. And so the public service can actually be a real barrier to getting things done if they happen to disagree with you. Or, you know, it's not that they'll actively oppose you, they just kind of don't get it done very quickly. You know, they just go a bit slow. And I think their real challenge is that as newer members, you know, we don't have that party institutional knowledge of that and so we've had to learn some of that ourselves the hard way um, i think there's a real value in investing personally as the minister you know and actually saying to the public service i'm going to do this differently and kind of making them do it sometimes when they're frightened of doing stuff and i really liked your example again as well around your agreement i've had a couple of things this year in the lead in the legal sectors where I had a very complex legal question about how to resolve jury policy of all things. It's the, the policy doesn't matter to an extent, but the public service was saying, well, we'll take a submission from all the various parties and we'll work out how to do something. I said, well, we're just going to end up in the middle of a, frankly, a, a fight then, and that's no good for us. So I said, why don't we get everyone in the room and have a conversation? And the public service went, well, how will that go? And so we invited the director of public prosecutions and the human rights commissioner and the Bar Association and the Law Society and a couple of other key stakeholders who had some quite different views. In an hour and a half, we solved it. And everyone walked out of the room going, that was amazing that we actually, but the two ingredients to that were, we invited everybody in the room. We treated them like adults. I went and actually chaired the meeting. I didn't farm it out to the public servants. I went and it was risky because it could have gone really badly. But I think that's saying that we Greens can do because we understand how to have a hard conversation, look for a consensus, consensus position. So I think there's a real opportunity for us as Greens parliamentarians to kind of actually lead those processes and demonstrate the stuff that we intuitively know because we've grown up in our party doing it, but lots of other people don't know it. And we can really bring that to the table. James, if I can, this is absolutely getting to the core, I think, of... Yeah greens, green lens and green approaches in governments and that really important question um, so, and I, and I skived off for a couple of seconds to go and get Chow Dede Kura, it's online as well um, which is our strategy and there's an action plan that goes with it um, and I, I've, we've got another, what, two years, less than two years James, before the end of our term I, I cannot guarantee that we will be ministers let alone in government, let alone in parliament at the next election. We don't control those. So I'm really clear that this needs to be embedded. I've got another less than two years to embed this strategy with the sector and the community in such a way. Um, of course, we're going, we're going to work really hard to come back. And of course, I would love another go at being a minister for another term to get this really, of course. But I'm not in control of that. So I've got another couple of years to get this embedded in the community and in the sector so much so that they will not tolerate a walk back or a water down or a cutback of any sort that veers off the path and the vision that is in this document, that they will not accept it, no matter who is a minister, no matter who is in government or not, that it will be protected so much 
and held so much by the people. And that goes back to that discussion about returning car to the people so that it is not acceptable to walk back on the agreements. And that, again, requires us to show that leadership and that connection to communities so that they believe in this work, not just in us as the Greens. That's awesome, thank you. I'm, I'm gonna um, bring Frank in here. Um, and then I'm going to turn over to some of the other questions that are in the chat. Um, Frank, you're currently in opposition. Uh, you know, you said you're the kind of leading opposition party in Parliament. So there's, you know, I guess a reasonable chance that you'll have the opportunity to form a government after the next election. That's a, that's a real possibility. Um, but you're in quite a different situation, right? You'll be coming in and picking something up from an outgoing government. Uh, and you'll also know, just like the four of us do, that your government will only last however long it'll last and that there will be things that you want the other team to pick up from you as well. How do you think about those transitions? Oh, well, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, the Rwandan constitution is a bit different. Uh, it allows that uh, um, the constitution says that the party which uh, wins the elections, the presidential elections, um, cannot have uh, more than 50% of the ministers from uh, that party. So uh, it also says that the president uh, can choose other ministers or other members of the cabinet, or even for state organs, from the parties in the parliament, but also from the independents. So we have actually been asking, even publicly, even on national media, to be included in government because that's the constitution. Because we are in parliament and the constitution allows us to be in government. But of course the government has refused to compete for the last three years. They are saying, no, we cannot work with you because you are pure opposition. We don't know how we can accommodate you and so on. So it has been quite, but we are, it's a constitutional challenge that we have been posing. And we had even a big a debate on the national TV with the Minister of Constitutional Affairs and Justice on that issue. And uh, I had a, a big uh, 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 favor from the public because when I had, was quoting the, quoting the constitution uh, and they were not respecting the constitution. So it's still a big debate here. So um, that said, uh, so it means that we have a chance of being in government uh, anytime, uh, uh, even next year, after next elections, whether we have, we have the majority or not the majority, but it will depend on of course, uh, uh, on how they will appreciate that we can be tolerant to them or, or, or if they think that we will not fight them. So they still fear because in Rwanda, the issue is that uh, if you are a member of the government, you have this spirit of collegiality that you cannot mention or oppose anything that has been argued in the cabinet outside. So whatever you argue in, um, in the cabinet, uh, you don't, or if you, you have expressed your views in cabinet that you don't agree with something, you don't mention it outside. So like you have said that you can say something that you don't agree with it, you, uh, you have, and we say some decisions and, and life will go on. But in Rwanda, if you do that, of course you just immediately lose your post um, in the cabinet. So that's what we have seen. And sometimes even what you oppose in the cabinet there in the separate can even affect you and it can still punish you for that. <laughs> yeah, so there's this, uh, we still, of course, we are still a young democracy. There's still this uh, uh, problem of freedom of, of expression and freedom of speech in Rwanda. That even those people, even the ruling party, they fear to express their opinions uh, exactly. So sometimes they want to tune in to what the president wants, and uh, that leads to uh, big, to big problems and gives us a chance, of course, to always see loopholes in what the decisions they have made. So I would say that. Uh, if we are in government, of course, there are some things that we do appreciate, like issues of security, that we have uh, the country secure from armed attacks and so on. Given that we, are in, uh, we have a, a big threat from neighboring countries like in Congo, there are labels there uh, who want for us to disobey Rwanda. So that one we appreciate. So I would say that we can keep on the good things the government has done, uh, like security and some programs maybe in the health sector or others in infrastructure development. So that's what we can take on. But then also if we are there, I would like them to note our difference that what have we done, um, maybe as a sustainable agriculture because that's the main um, employment activity for 
over 80 percent of Rwanda is agriculture and most of it is sustainable agriculture. So we do have some policies which the government has taken, but we'll, we'll maybe um, do more on that and maybe in the uh, social sector, uh, eliminating poverty, because poverty is still a big problem uh, in Rwanda, poverty aviation. So I think that we can bridge some of the good things they have done, take them on, and make sure that uh, ours will make it uh, strong enough that uh, if the next government comes in, they will not uh, swallow them up and make them people forget that we have done this year. So I think it also involves um, uh, consultations with the uh, people to make sure that um, Every time you do something, you have consulted people. What do they? Uh, what are their main issues? That's what we try to do. That uh, when we are revolving our manifesto, that the issues we put in our manifesto are people's issues, and that way, if you act on them, people will see that you are actually acting on what they they have expressed. And then also trying to work with the media, though we do have challenges with the freedom of the media. But uh, the more you talk about something, I think uh, that is a saying that uh, people will still end up believing it because we, if you always say something in parliament, in the media, people will know that this is a, your, your key value, something you stand uh, way on. So I think uh, that would be one of the things we could try to do, bridging up the gap here. Maybe you can also share more of your experience here, since we are not yet in government anyway, though we hope to be in government anytime soon. Yeah. Yeah, well, we, I mean, it, it's a fascinating conundrum, but especially because in climate change policy, you know, we're talking about a multi-decade effort, uh, you know, and so in our first term of government, we passed something called the Zero Carbon Act, um, and that sets out our targets to the year 2050 to become a net zero economy, um, and it set up an independent climate change commission to kind of guide the pathway and the sort of process for these interim stepping stone emissions budget, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And we worked really, really hard on bringing the opposition, the conservative opposition along with us on that, um, because we recognised that if we came in with this really brilliant goal for, you know, becoming net zero and so on, uh, and they weren't on board, then they would simply, you know, get rid of it when they next got into government. Um, and so getting that agreement around the architecture uh, was kind of critically important. And obviously, they're, you know, they're a conservative party, right? That it's sort of, and they've not been flash on climate change um, in, in their times in, in government. And they and and they've got this kind of prevailing mentality that climate action comes at the expense of the economy, you know, rather than so on. So you've got all of that. So there were definitely compromises that got built into that. Um, but overall, I think that we've now managed to get to a situation, you know, in fact, the, the current climate change spokesperson for the opposition for the National Party said, well, you know, in this country. We can, you know, there's complete political consensus that you should have a publicly funded education system, right? No one's going to get rid of our publicly funded education system or our publicly funded health system. Um, there's a lot of disagreement about what the curriculum should be, you know, what kind of support people should, you know, like there's all this kind of argument about different features of the system, but there's no, no argument about whether or not there should be such a system. And, and he, he was sort of equating that to, to this climate change policy now, which he said, now that we've got consensus that we need to get to net zero by 2050, we're going to argue along the way about lots of the features by how we get there, you know, and some people will have some ideas that are more effective than others, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, but at least we're not arguing about the goal, right? At least, at least we've kind of settled, settled that. So to, that, that to me, I think, is the best example of one that I've personally been involved in of, of trying to manage, you know, how do you manage, you know, as Rebecca was talking about, that kind of the, the politics of the long term, given that, you know, politics is by its very nature a short term um, business. Speaking of politics, Shane, there's a question in the chat. I'm going to take us in a little different direction here. This is from David Faith, Faith or Fife. Um, uh, Shane and Rebecca, do you think the experience of the Greens and the ALP, the Australian Labor Party, working together in the Australian Capital Territory can be replicated at the national level in the federal parliament? 
Um, and it's um, as a kind of a keen observer of Australian politics, I'm keen to uh, know the answer to that as well. But I think in terms of the wider question here, there's a sort of when you've, uh, you know, when you've got success, and I think we had Mike from uh, Santa Monica before, you know, who's been a mayor in a, in a, uh, in a jurisdiction uh, in California. When, you, when the Greens get success at any level of government, um, assuming, well, when you, get into, when you get into government, assuming that you succeed, how easy is it and how can you replicate that or, or kind of get benefit for the Greens beyond the jurisdiction that you're responsible for? Because I know, I mean, just looking at Australian politics, um, the relationship's pretty variable uh, in different parts of the country. <laughs> yeah. Look, I mean, I think the answer to the core question is emphatically yes, it can work at a federal level if people want to. I mean, I think that Australian politics it is uncommon in the sense that you see in the UK and the US and a few others, but the more common politics across the planet, look across Europe and many other places, is having multi party governments. It's in Australia that it's actually considered to be a weakness in some way, whereas in most other countries, it's a common occurrence. And I think we've demonstrated in the ACT that it is possible. Um, it is different here in a way that I think our Labor Party is more progressive. For example, uh, for those that know Australian politics at all, we did have a Greens Labor government in Tasmania some years ago. Uh, Tasmania is a part of the country where there's a big forestry debate. And so you had a really fundamental difference between the two parties about a core issue in their government for which they just came from polar opposite points. And that created an ongoing and almost structural tension in their government that was very hard to resolve. And we've not had those experiences here. Um, I have been spending time with Adam Bant and Nick and Larissa, our leadership team in the Federal Greens, talking about some of our experiences. Adam, of course, was there when the Greens formed a partnership with Julia Gillard's government in around 2010. So there's some good experience around. It is possible, but it needs both parties to want to come to the table. And again, I'd pick up Mara's earlier point around uh, the relationship side of it. You need everyone. And I find your example in New Zealand fascinating, James, where Jacinda Ardern did not need you guys in the government and yet she invited you. I'd be fascinated to hear your take on why she did that. My assumption is that she took a, both, I think you made a good impression last term, but I think she also took a long-term decision that actually this is a very unique outcome under your electoral system and she'll probably need you again in the future and it was worth it. And so I think that was a really sensible relational decision and it underlines how important the relationships are. In the governments that I've been involved in here, we've now had three different chief ministers the first one hated power sharing with us, absolutely hated it. It was a complete insult to him. He was quite arrogant and he hated that he had to do it and it was painful the whole time. But his successor, who happened to be a woman as it, as it turned out, was much more about working together, building common opportunities, understanding what we could do together and also how then we work through the hard stuff. Uh, and her successor looked at both of those models and I think actually the second one was better. Uh, so we've seen really different relationships and it does come down a lot to the personalities involved, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, Shane, just um, to respond to that point, I would agree with you. Uh, you know, I think Jacinda Ardern is, is aware of anybody that the result that they got in the 2020 election was a freak occurrence uh, and the chances that it could be replicated again in the future are close to nil. Um, and, and, you know, so there is a there is a kind of a view in public. She also did talk about, you know, bringing in our expertise in particular domains, um, which I think speaks to your point about the relationship that we built in the first term of government uh, as well. And, and kind of a sense of comfort there that we, you know, I mean, they had a massive caucus, right? So it's not like they were short of people to put into ministerial <laughs> positions and they had to manage that tension internally. Um, because every job they gave to us was a job they didn't give to one of their own people when they didn't need to give us those jobs. But I think she did sort of say, well, you know, they do actually have, you know, a particular angle and a particular view, and that 
itself is kind of useful, right? To, to have it, to have that diversity in the near term as well as, um, I mean, if we were to be particularly gauche about it, not wanting to piss us off in advance of the next election, <laughs> um, where, um, you know, she's going to need us then. But I wonder, Marama, what's your kind and, of and probably take James on to that? add. Yeah, absolutely correct, um, Shane. Your your analysis is is absolutely point on in terms in as far as I'm concerned, and the particular expertise she's um, explicitly stated. So I want to be really clear. I am privileged to be the minister um, for prevention violence this term, but actually our green colleague, green MP, amazing woman Jan Logie, preempted the foundation for this work and has a very particular expertise in that area. So. As you say, we'd built up a record of expertise in these very ministerial portfolios. There was also, um, <laughs> there was also, I think you probably couldn't ignore the the opt, or not just the optics, but the reality of the Greens in full opposition mode, and you know, in full constant, constant, constant opposition mode, which we've got a lot of practice at. We're well versed. We're, we're well versed. And so I think that was another, you know, a bit of a thought there is like, yeah, they're probably also a gigantic pain in the ass in full opposition mode as well. <laughs> and you've just been in cabinet, so you know where all the skeletons are. Yeah, well, there is that. <laughs> um, okay, great. So I. Uh, I'm just going to sort of troll through some of the other questions. We've only got about 15 minutes left. Um, and there were a couple of questions there. There was one from Gabrielle. And Frank, I wonder if you might turn your uh, attention to this question. And she's talking, it is a bit different because all of us are in Parliament, right? So in, you know, in Rwanda and Australia and, and New Zealand, um, but Gabrielle's saying, look, in some, quest in some countries, the Greens don't, they've got no chance to be even in parliament, let alone in government. Um, and the laws are made only for big parties. And actually, there's another question from one of our American colleagues in the chat as well, who's talking about how the two big parties are sort of designing the electoral laws to suit themselves and to lock out third parties and so on. So, it, you know, Gabrielle goes on and says the, the election regulation laws should be changed. Um, ha, when, you know, when we were starting off, Rebecca talked a lot about the incredible resource and the information that you have when you're in government, even versus an opposition. But when you can't even be in parliament, you know, you're sort of really, really on the fringe in terms of, of, of all of that. So what, how do, you, how do you think that Green parties should try and orient themselves when they're not even in parliament and don't really have much chance to get in due to the nature of the laws of their country? Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Uh, um, perhaps first we uh, start with our experience because uh, when we got registered as a party uh, in 2013, we had no chance to uh, to uh, to campaign for parliament because uh, we got registration um, one day before the closing of the uh, uh, the deadline for for submitting candidates. Yeah, so we spent five years uh, when we were party, which uh, uh, five years out of parliament. It was quite very difficult for us as a party. Um, we had no access to information and uh, we could all just see everything in the media and nothing more. You don't know where things are decided from, either no copy of the national budget or draft, whatever. So nothing completely. Yeah. It was very frustrating uh, because in parliament, of course, we get access to much of government information here, yeah. whether you're in opposition or not opposition, you, we all get the, uh, the same information. And, uh, but in, when we are not in parliament, you have nothing. And um, of course, even no resources and uh, uh, it's quite difficult, but the difference was uh, maybe our, our system and uh, uh, the system in Uganda. Uh, in Uganda, I think they have, they have a, a, a constituency uh, system. I think it could be like the same as UK or the same as you have there whereby an MP uh, goes into a, a constituency and campaigns and people vote for him from that constituency, though you are from the party, but uh, people vote for you directly. So whereas in Rwanda, we are on the party list. Uh, so it's a party which campaigns uh, for the elections. The party has the, the, the candidates, and then the party has to get a national vote, be voted at least 5% to enter into parliament. The same as like it is in Sweden, yeah. 
So it's a proportional, uh, is it representation? So the, the more votes you get, the more MPs you get. So I think that uh, um, uh, what we could, uh, as Greens all over the world, you could ask to have proportional representation. I think it would, uh, it, though it's difficult to get the 5% or 4%, but it gives you more chance of having uh, opportunity to enter. Whereas uh, this winner takes it all system, uh, uh, it's quite difficult, like I think in the US or in the UK, uh, to do, um, uh, you call it fraud? I, I, I forgot the term they call it. Yeah, to, to get uh, someone uh, uh, enter. Because in the UK, we do have only uh, our MP, Karen Lucas, and I think in Canada, we have Elizabeth May. So it's quite difficult. And I think they've tried, I think in Canada, you have a second one. But I think it's quite difficult to do with that system to enter. But if it's a proportional representation, there would be more chance. You could work hard. I may have uh, some votes in one region or in one district team and less in another district team, but all those votes are counted together and then you can make it, yeah. So I think this is something worth considering. And I think the Greens in Kenya, they have been asking for the same system like we have in Rwanda, because um, it gives them a chance. When you have uh, these major parties, uh, they make sure, especially the party, that in every district, if it's a constituency, they have someone who is very rich, uh, they put forward, and someone who maybe has been in government before, and they give all the resources. And sometimes, like in Uganda, the president of the republic goes to campaign for that candidate in that area. So it, it's quite difficult for the opposition to win. Sometimes they do win, but it's really a big fight, yeah. So I think that uh, in Rwanda, if we had a constitutional system, it would still be very difficult. Though previous as a party, we have asked for that, but now we have realized that actually uh, the ruling party would take everything as they do in the local elections, because the lo local elections, we do not have, uh, it's not open for parties, it's on individual merit, but parties of course organized from behind the scenes. So you find that all mayors, like 98%, they are all, uh, yeah, 98%, they are all from the ruling party. So they give one from the social democrats and another one from the uh, liberal party, but they take everything else. But openly there, they say they are not campaigning, but all of them, they become party chairman or party chairperson in the district after they, mm -hmm. they win elections, which means that of course, they are the ones who organize that. So basically I think that uh, we should uh, push more for proportional representation. But Frank, what you've just said resonates exactly with the experience that we had here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. So the Green Party was formed in 1990. There was a there was a preceding party called the Values Party, uh, which was formed in the 1970s, um, and then eventually became the Green Party. But it never got any representation because under the system that we had then, it really was you know this two the two party um, system based on the British Westminster system. Um, and I think it was really only as a function of the economic reforms in the 1980s where such a large portion of the population felt disempowered by two successive governments um, that the political pressure came to change the system, you know, because the, the population was saying, well, it doesn't seem to matter who we elect, you know, Team Red or Team Blue, we kind of get the same result and we don't like it. So we, we adopted a proportional representation system through referendum, two referendums, first in 1993 and then in 1996. And then we had our first proportional representation election in 1999. And that was the first election that the Greens managed to come into parliament under our own steam. So it, there is like a you know clear relationship. And I know, you know, Elizabeth May from Canada very well, you know, she's been trying to get proportional representation on the agenda over there because they're, you know, it's just one of those things that, that the vote distribution just isn't fair. You mentioned Caroline Lucas, the only Green member of parliament in the British parliament, which has over 500 members of parliament, but they regularly poll anywhere from, you know, kind of five, six, seven percent of the vote in terms of the numbers of votes that they get, but they certainly don't have five or six or seven percent of the members of parliament. Um, they've only got they've only got the one. So that I think it's a really good point. If you're in one of those countries that maybe electoral reform is the thing that you should focus on first. The other thing that I wanted to pick up on was your point about um, the mayors. So because we were effectively locked out of parliament when we first got going, we actually focused on local government uh, and, and we focused on winning um, seats around council tables. Interestingly enough, when we got into parliament, we sort of forgot about local government for a while. Uh, and really it's just only in the last two 
uh, two or three electoral cycles that we've really started to put effort and resource back into local government. Because, of course, many of the things that we care about as Greens, those decisions are actually made by councils um, in, in our municipalities, in our cities, and our towns, rather than by, you know, big, bad central government. So, um, okay. I, and actually, just on that, uh, there's a note from Alex and uh, S Sabina uh, Lotensack saying that we still have the first past the post electoral system here in Canada. Greens don't even don't stand a chance, even though they get more than a million votes uh, in the last election. Um, and just on that, those uh, Greta was it? Sorry, Greta, um, Sabina, and sorry, just give me a tick. Yeah, Alex and Sabina had a question, which I think would be quite a good question for us to start to wrap up our conversation today. Um, they say, as green politicians in government, you're not only responsible for the workings of your country's governments, you're also part of a global movement and your presence today suggests that you acknowledge that. How do you handle tensions between obligations to global sustainability versus electoral obligations? How can you use your position to make a difference for the global green movement? Shane, can I start with you on that one? Yeah, thanks, James. It's a fascinating question. I actually don't think there is a tension there. I think it actually all fits together. You know, the great cliche of the environment movement has always been um, think global, act local. Yeah, and it's it's actually very true. Uh, and one of the things I'm really conscious of and always have been in my time in the assembly and my job before I came into politics was I worked for Greenpeace International uh, and I did a whole lot of stuff at UN level you know big picture international things and I came back to this sort of very localized government and people were saying well why would you do that but the point is that actually those very local decisions are very important and I've always had the view that as a small jurisdiction if we we also happen to come from a wealthy jurisdiction, from a wealthy country who has the capability to do things better. I think we have a moral duty to not only do our thing and do it well, but to create the examples that others can pick up and copy. And we've been able to do that, you know, for a, I'll use a little example, we put together an electric vehicle policy here that was so well received, we got a national award for it. And the National Electric Vehicle Association uses our policy and goes to all the other governments around Australia and says, you should just copy this. And so I think you can do those things because I know when I used to work in Greenpeace as an NGO, when you go and lobby a government, you'd be saying, well, this government over here is doing something really good. Why don't you copy them? And so I think there's an opportunity for us, each of us at a local level to do things in a way that's really good that others can copy or at least morph to their own local circumstances. So. Uh, I guess every day I feel like I've got to do the local job for my, for my community, but I can also have a broader impact. And the other thing we can do is we can take those chances to help others where we can. You know, I often really go out of my way to talk to NGOs. Uh, we have twinning relationships with some of the Pacific parliaments. And I always make sure I make the time to get involved in those things because I'm in a fortunate position of both having now quite a bit of experience and I guess the resources and capability to help with those things. And I think that's part of what we can do as well. Great. Thank you, Shane. Manama, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, Global, very, act local. Yeah, absolutely. Very similar to, to Shane's experience. I guess my, my extra lens is <laughs> um, before Parliament, I was very much involved in both global and local indigenous led movements and particularly indigenous women led movements and I was speaking earlier about how that absolutely connects a holistic understanding of environment people communities climate future all being interrelated and connected and so in actual fact they they're both sort of add value um, relationships globally adding value to local movements. A big example is, um, oh, why has it all gone out of my head? Is some of the, um, well, actually, a lot of you will remember uh, some of the Occupy movements that also spread around the world. In actual fact, when it got here to, to um, Auckland, to Aotearoa, we needed to make sure that we, as 
activists, as Indigenous activists, which were the networks that I was involved in long before becoming an MP, added a decolonization Indigenous leadership aspect into, because essentially what people were uprising against were Western patriarchal colonizing neoliberal economic systems. The things that we had been campaigning and, and standing up against as a colonized country forever. And so um, that sort of understanding of global connected movements to local action was always a, a thing. And it's just something that continues into my political agenda, our Green Party Kaupapa agenda. Um, the obvious examples of climate change offer us that very, very understanding of the strength of global movements. And our kids here in Aotearoa, we had a nine-year-old in Wellington, um, inspired by Greta, um, inspired by her local community and leaders, organizing school marches for climate change. So, you know, those connections actually have, have added value and have fed into our politics. Rebecca, last thoughts on, on a theme? Yeah, look, um, thanks very much. And look, I think that we, we share lots of the same, same views, I think. And I think one of the beautiful and unique things about being involved in the Greens is that absolutely we are a political party. We need to recognise that, you know, uh, recognise and, and grasp, you know, political power when to, for the um, for the good of community. But we are essentially a movement and we are essentially a global, global movement. And, you know, the power of events such as these and of engaging, the, the power of showing up, which I always talk about as my... That feels like that's my superpower to show up to engage because we just do, you know, learn so much from each other. The um, the richness of what I've learned from what's what's going on um, across the world just in this conversation um, is so nurturing uh, for me. I hope it's been <laughs> helpful for other people as well. But we are just so much stronger when we come together and to come from that basis of a of those shared values um, and really, you know, shared language in terms of the things that motivate us, that bring us together, that, you know, we have different, you know, we have different experiences and tools, but the ability for, for us to learn from each other. And, and I know that we've been really appreciative of the sharing that has happened and, you know, hopefully um, we can, you know, we can, we can do a little bit of that as well. Thank you, Rebecca. Frank, last thoughts. Thank you very much. I think this has been a very interesting uh, uh, session. Uh, first of all, is that uh, um, people like in Rwanda, they view you even going to parliament, uh, most because we do have a lot of opposition groups in exile. Um, some of them are armed groups. Uh, so, and uh, some of them are genociders who committed a genocide in 1994. So they always see you going to parliament as like a crime even talking about getting into government, they see it as a crime because they don't want to, you to associate uh, and, uh, with the government. So it looks like we've been trying to show them that, you know, we are a political party. We, we, we are not, we didn't create the party just to be outside, outside the system, just to be uh, on the media. We need to be there where decisions are taken from, where the decisions are made. So we need to be part of the discussion and be part of the decision makers. And the real, real challenge, because they want you to just be talking in the media and uh, just mention people's concerns, but do nothing about them. And they always want the government to be, to be, take, to, to be the one to be blamed. So we, we think it's important for Greens all over the world uh, to do whatever they can. If you are in parliament, also try to be in government. And uh, if you are not there, try to, to do anything in a local government. Because we say whether you are in local government, you are mayor, or you're a local councillor, it's still part of the process that you are taking some decisions. At least you are not, you are part of the table, you are on the table, yeah. So I think that uh, uh, this is a good set, very, very good session that we have had. And I would encourage our other Greens all over the world uh, to strive for that because uh, we learn more and then you are not surprised. Uh, of course, now we're in parliament, we also get surprised because some things happen in government and we didn't know, we're not aware of them. Uh, but we say, if I was there, maybe I would have given them some advice. So I still, want to be in government and we're going to work for that yeah thank you so much yeah. thanks frank and that's a perfect note for us to finish on so um <clears throat>
it would be nice to wrap up uh, with some concluding thoughts. Um, so uh, we started the conversation almost two hours ago now, uh, and a lot of the conversation was around the compromises of, of being in government and is it worth it uh, and, and so on. And I, I hope uh, that what you have heard uh, here, I think universally across this panel, is that you get a whole lot more done uh, for people and for planet when you're in government than when you're not in government. But that isn't to say that it's easy and it isn't to say that there aren't compromises. Uh, and, you know, I think the conversation has uh, gone a lot towards how you can, um, you know, bring people along with you, particularly your own uh, party members and the people who voted for you and, you know, put you into office. What are the ways that you can work through with your partner parties in government so that you don't get swamped, so that you're able to still have a voice? even if there are more of them uh, than there are of you? How do you use Green Party um, uh, kind of ways of doing things and doing things differently so that the way that we exercise power when we are in government uh, is different from the way that it's been in the past and that that leaves an indelible mark uh, for when we're not in government uh, in the future um, and, and so that the things that we do are legacy projects, um, not just in the, in the here and now. And my sense is uh, that, you know, between um, those uh, systems that we've managed to represent here, the um, government of New Zealand, the government of the Australian Capital Territory, uh, and Frank in the parliament in Rwanda, where there's obviously a lot of differences between, uh, I hope that you've also heard a lot of similarities in terms of how we're facing those challenges. Uh, and I hope um, if you're in that kind of position uh, that, you know, you've been able to draw something uh, from this conversation in terms of things that might uh, you might do differently, um, decisions you might make uh, differently, but also hope to affirm some of the ways that you do do things uh, and to kind of recognise that the experience that you're having uh, is actually being had in a number of different places uh, all over the world at the same time. Um, so thank you very much for joining us uh, on this panel discussion. Um, thank you to Frank uh, for being a bit of a late ring in there. We sort of dropped you in the deep end, um, but really appreciate you joining us on this. Thank you to Rebecca, uh, to Shane, to Martima, um, and to the team at the Global Greens for um, putting this on. I noticed that there's a number of uh, points in the chat. Um, thank you very much for your comments. Thank you for your questions. I'm sorry if we haven't been able to respond uh, to all of them, but really appreciate your time and your engagement. Nore tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tato katoa.